Welcome to tonight's webinar, Seating and Wheeled Mobility, What Are the Options? This program is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the MS Society of Canada. For those of you who are new to Can Do MS, we deliver health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit our website, cando-ms.org, to learn more about our online and nationwide in-person programs. We are excited to partner with the National MS Society on our annual webinar series. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. Visit nationalmssociety.org for more information. We are also brought to you by Needy Meds, which is a nonprofit that connects people free and anonymously to programs that will help them afford their health care expenses. For more information, please visit needymeds.org. Hopefully you've logged on uh, with no issues this evening. If uh, you are having technical issues, you can call the GoToWebinar attendee support line at 877-582-7011. We'd also like to let you know that this program is being recorded and an archive will be available on both the Can Do MS website and the National MS Society website. We'd like for this to be a, a conversation and a dialogue, uh, so you'll have an opportunity to submit questions. So we're gonna save about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as possible. You can submit questions uh, right in your chat box if you're, if you're logged on and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, if you're calling in, unfortunately, we can't take any questions uh, over the phone and your phone lines have been muted. But if you're joining us on your computer, uh, you can sub submit questions right in that question and chat box. So tonight, uh, we were thrilled to, to talk about seating and wheeled mobility, uh, which is such an important topic to, to many people living with MS. Uh, tonight's learning objectives, uh, both participants as well as support partners, uh, all the family members and spouses and partners and friends, uh, we would like to, you, to teach you uh, how seating and wheel mobility can improve uh, functional, functional mobility, safety, and quality of life. We'll also go over features of different types of wheelchairs as well as other seating systems. We'll review the benefits of good posture and, and provide some tips for healthy seating. We'll go over the components of a seating evaluation, as well as providing some resources, including therapists and suppliers that can help you along your path. And then to do that, we're thrilled to welcome uh, two speakers this evening. We have Jean Minkle, who's a physical therapist and master clinician, who is well recognized for her work in assistive technology. She is currently the Senior Vice President of Care Coordination and Rehab Services for Independent Care, a nonprofit in New York City. And we're also joined by Faith Saffler Savage, uh, who has over 35 years of experience as a physical therapist, seating specialist, and rehabilitation technology supplier. Uh, 25 of those years have been spent at the Boston Home, uh, which is based in Dorchester, Massachusetts, where she helps residents with MS and other chronic disabilities uh, find the appropriate equipment for their needs. Uh, they both been, have been published in several um, journals and case studies and books uh, so they are uh, really a wealth of knowledge in all the areas re regarding seating and wheel mobility. So it's my honor to turn things over to Faith and Jean. Well, thanks, Brian. We really appreciate the opportunity. And um, Faith and I really wanted to put out there a bit of the yin and yang of wheelchairs. So we are two physical therapists who can talk about wheelchairs with great delight and passion, uh, but we recognize that a, the wheelchair itself is the disability symbol. And so there is a tangible sign when one is needing to rely on wheeled mobility to get around that particularly for people living with MS, it's a sign of losing function. And in getting around in the built environment, Getting around in a wheelchair is never as efficient as if you were walking unaided or unassisted. However, if your ambulation is labored or you have challenges with your balance and frequently falling or becoming short of breath, introducing a wheelchair into your mobility options can really help you get around 
without being tired. And when you're not tired, this new method of mobility can help get you back into life and enjoy activities that maybe slowly you've shied away from and not participated in because your ability to get around has been more difficult. So we really want you to think about the wheelchair as a, as a tool that can restore quality of life to your life and to those who support you. So we're going to cover a broad area, but we really want to focus on some of the benefits of looking after seating and mobility. Having the right device can give you the greatest independence. And you know, if you think about getting around in a city, you may be able to, to walk a block or two, but if you find out your destination's 10 blocks away, you're apt to hop a bus or catch a cab or in New York City now you can catch the, the city bikes. There's lots of wheeled mobility that help people get around. And that's how we want you to think about the wheelchair as a tool for increased independence and accessing your community, going to school, going to work, visiting friends, and particularly getting re-engaged in activities that you may have slowly retreated from. Much like a, a pair of shoes that fit you well, you can wear them all day, you're comfortable, you feel good, as opposed to those shoes that just kind of don't fit so well. A wheelchair that does not fit you well can be really uncomfortable, limit your sitting tolerance, and not provide the opportunities to be a tool to improve your independence. So a well-fitting chair improves your posture, can prevent pressure sores, and increase your physical activity. And then finally, when someone feels that the chair is fitted to them and it fits in their environment, self-esteem and confidence can rise and people feel better about themselves because they have a tool to re-engage in the life that they want to pursue. So when is it really time to think about rolling around in your world? And I love this slide because the, the woman is using a walker, but if you'll notice, the walk sign has already gone away. It's a do not walk sign. The bus is already through the crosswalk. It just shows you that if you can't walk at what's called a standard walking speed because you're short of breath or your coordination is off, you're really minimizing your ability to keep up with the flow. So are you able, with whatever device you're using, keep up with your loved ones, your care partners, other people who are ambulating without an aid? If you can keep up with them, that's great. If you're falling behind and you're having a harder time and you're not able to keep up that walking speed, there's a question as to whether your mobility is actually functional. So we're going to talk about functional mobility and what does that mean. And I love this description because it was provided to me by a woman living with MS. And when I asked her what did functional mobility mean, she was very forthright and said, the ability to go where I want to go when I want to go. And that's a mindset that says, I want to be able to go where I want to go without being exhausted or out putting myself into danger. The danger may be from crossing the street or from frequent falls or from not being able to negotiate the steps. So looking at functional mobility and asking, what tools do I need in order to be as functional as possible in the environments I want to get around. So we are going to start looking at wheeled mobility bases and what are the options. We're going to really focus on different devices that offer different features. And one of the things that is going to become apparent, you think of this as 
a tour down the auto mile. And we're going to start with the compact economy cars and then we'll be moving up and looking at devices that have more capabilities designed to be indoor and outdoor uses. But there's a reason there's such a range of devices on the market because no one device fits each person's mobility needs. The key here is to try and match what's my environment of use, what's my physical capability, and which device is going to best match my needs and allow me to be as functional in the environment of use. So moving on to at the economy end, but really serving a really cool niche are transport chairs. And as uh, shown in this slide, these are really designed for uh, a caregiver or a family member to be able to push you around. It has the smallest profile. The wheels fit underneath the seat. It's not designed for long-term, multiple hours of sitting, but it's great to be in the back of a car, unfold it very quickly, be able to go through a shopping mall, go into the church services, and know that it's an easy device that allows somebody to help you expand your mobility range. One caution is because it has these four little wheels, negotiating uneven surfaces can be challenging for the person that's pushing you because the small wheels don't do well over cracks and crevices and trying to get over curb cuts. But the next device is really a hybrid designed to kind of solve that outdoor mobility problem. So if you look carefully at this slide, there are still four little wheels underneath the seat. But in addition, you can add an additional large wheel. And this is a removable wheel. You can take it off if you're in a tight space. You can add it on if you know you're going to be negotiating an environment that a bigger wheel will lead to a smoother ride. It adds to the number of components you have to take on and off, but it also gives the advantage that if you have the ability with upper extremity um, pushing, that you could move yourself around in a short distance and, and small spaces. So this is a hybrid transport chair, really designed again for moving from point A to point B, but not being used on an all day, every day basis. Next. So the next two chairs are really uh, standard manual chairs that are really built for their durability. They, they have a fixed rear wheel axis, which makes them very stable. They're not as likely to tip over, but they're really designed for rental fleets, or I often call this the, you know, the airport transport chair. You can get in it at the front door of the airport, and it's a good way to get you to the gate. But after an hour or so of sitting in this type of chair, you're likely to be really uncomfortable. And there's not much adjustability to these chairs, and that's almost by design. They're really designed to be a fixed fleet chair that won't meet your day-to-day -day needs if you're needing to sit in a wheelchair for more than two or three hours at a time. The next one, this is just a lighter weight version of the standard chair. It does have a little bit more adjustability. That rear axle, I can move up and down on the frame of the chair. If I move the wheel up, I can lower the seat height and uh, allows the chair to be able to put your foot on the floor if you are trying to use foot propulsion as a means of getting around. A little bit easier to push, not too much, and really designed more for your caregiver if you're needing a lighter weight chair to go with the lightweight standard chair. Next. Now we're looking at 
a group of chairs that if you have the ability to self-propel a manual chair, and that really requires upper extremity strength and coordination, and you'll be sitting in the chair for several hours at a time, you want to be fitted for an ultralight chair. It will be uh, the right width and depth to fit your body. And most importantly, we can move the wheel into a position that makes it easier for you to self-propel. We're always a little bit cautious. The further you move the wheel forward, the easier the chair is to push but it's also easier to tip over. So when we configure an ultralight wheelchair for a person that's self-propelling, we also want to give them wheelchair mobility skills training. So you learn if you're going up a ramp in this type of chair, you need to lean forward to make sure that you're shifting your body weight forward so that you don't tip over going up an incline. In this picture, there's a chair that's called a cross frame chair. Notice there's an X underneath the seat. This allows you to fold the chair in a side-by-side -side nature, much like all other chairs, and you can remove the wheels. So you can get this down to a pretty small package. If you go to the next picture, this is called a ultralight rigid chair. And you'll notice there's much less hardware underneath the seat. This allows us to save a lot on the weight of the chair uh, and still have that ability to move the rear wheel underneath the seat to improve your ease of propulsion. To transport this type of chair, you do pop the wheels off and oftentimes the backrest will fold down onto the seat itself. That's the smallest of the package. Sometimes it fits in the back of a, of a trunk. Oftentimes people will even sit it right on the seat of the, cha of the car if there isn't somebody in the passenger seat or if somebody can get the chair out for you. Um, but rigid frame chairs are built specifically to your body dimensions and we set the wheel up to make self-propulsion as easy as possible. Next. For people who have more postural support needs, in order to be up against gravity, they need an adjustment as to where their body is in relationship to gravity. These are two types of positioning chairs. So a tilt chair allows us to change the position relative to gravity without changing your backrest angle or your legrest angle. So it's uh, tilting the whole chair almost like a rocking chair, but you can fix it in one position. A recliner, on the other hand, when you change the angle of the backrest and change the um, backrest, uh, the angle of the footrest, you're opening up, you're changing the angles between the back and the buttocks and the legs. You can configure a recliner chair into a fully lay down position if that's an advantage to either you or your caregivers. In this picture, the tilt chair is shown with a small rear wheel and is designed to be pushed by somebody else. But if we go to the next picture, Tilt chairs can also be equipped with a larger wheel to allow for self-propulsion. And, and you may say, well, you know, what's the difference between the ultralight chair and the tilt chair if both of them are equipped with the big wheel? Oftentimes, the occupants in the tilt chair need the orientation in space to be changed so that gravity is in front of the person's chest and gravity is a friend to help somebody sit up. If your seat is too upright and you don't have enough trunk control, you may find it difficult to hold that position. So tilt allows us to give some postural control as well as give the person some self-propulsion capabilities. 
next. About 10 years ago, there was a kind of a new technology introduced that allowed a bridge between manual wheelchair propulsion and fully adopting a power wheelchair as your primary means of getting around. And in this type of a power assist wheel, you replace the push wheel that comes on a standard chair with a chair that has a instrumented push rim. And the advantage of the push rim is if I give it one good push, the wheel actually continues to roll at a much longer distance. And the advantage for a self propeller is I don't have to work as hard to travel as long a distance. I have fewer strokes with less force, but I'm able to cover the same distance. So for people who have been longtime manual wheelchair riders, they're not quite ready to make the transition yet. These power assist products allow a bridge so I can maintain self propulsion, but I don't have to work so hard for every push to give me the distance travel that I might need. In addition to this type of a power assist, there's also a fifth wheel option, which literally adds on to the manual wheelchair as it was originally configured. And by the use of actually a little wristband that talks to the fifth wheel, I can tap the wheel, I can push my push rims, and this fifth wheel will again extend the length of the distance of the push. And you can actually now get these uh, this fifth wheel configured so that it's a constant. So if I know I'm going to a park that has long distances, I can give it one push and it will stay a steady state until I hold those wheels again. So these have proven to be a really nice, as I said, bridge option when you're not quite ready to make that transition to a, a fully motorized system. Next. If your upper extremities are not strong enough or you don't have the coordination or you don't have the, the balance to uh, self-propel a manual chair, many folks gravitate towards the scooter as a tool to add to your mobility options. And, you know, one of the best things about a scooter, it doesn't look like a wheelchair. So there's a, a social acceptance and a feeling like I'm just adding this little device so I can get around where I want to go, um, but it doesn't look like I'm needing a wheelchair. In order to successfully use a scooter, however, you really do need to have quite good sitting balance because we can't change your position in gravity. There's not a lot of postural supports we can add to a, a scooter seat. And you do need to have enough upper extremity control to keep your arms up on that tiller and to use your hands and fingers as a means of both controlling your speed and direction as well as steering the chair. In this picture, it's a three-wheeled scooter. They're also available in four-wheel. You can go ahead. Uh, the four-wheel scooter provides a bit more stability, particularly in turns, um, but it also then introduces a greater turning radius. So uh, particularly we find if someone's relying on public transportation, the three-wheeled scooter might make it onto the public bus and the four-wheel scooter, it's just too big of a turn and they can't get from the entry point of the bus into a, a docking area that's safe for transport. So the difference between three and four-wheel scooters, four-wheel gives you increased stability, but you're um, taking on a greater turning radius. Next. When you move from a scooter to a traditional power chair, uh, this particular chair shows a traditional wheelchair frame that was added on 
with a motor and a joystick. And in the power wheelchair world, this is the smallest little footprint. Uh, we can do some improvements of the postural support on this type of chair, but we can't put any power seating onto it. So it has the advantage of a smaller footprint, but it's not going to have the flexibility of being able to change as your functional needs might be changing. Next. There is a category of chairs that are absolutely built for indoor use only. And if that's all you need them for, then it's a small footprint. You'll notice that the, the drive wheel has now been placed right underneath the seat. This is called a mid-wheel drive. In order to keep the chair stable, you have a total of six wheels. Um, the seat on this particular device is we call a captain seat. Looks a lot like an automobile seat. In the seating and mobility world, we call these sit and go. If you can sit in it and operate it, you're good to go. Uh, but it, again, doesn't have a lot of flexibility if your needs change. It does allow you a quite tight turning radius for an indoor or a smaller uh, living environment. It doesn't handle outdoor environments very well. It tends to, um, it, really the durability of this chair gets compromised the more you use it outside. Next. Much more frequently, if somebody is relying on power mobility, we look at indoor-outdoor devices. And in this group of products, there are a couple of important uh, feature distinctions. And that is, is the drive wheel going to be in the rear wheel position, the mid wheel position, or the front wheel position? And I'll talk you through what are the advantages of each of those configurations. Next. So the rear wheel drive is the most stable configuration if you like traveling at very high speeds. And lots of experienced power wheelchair users like being able to turn up the speed. They leave their ambulatory uh, caregivers and loved ones literally in the dust. So high speed, a rear wheel drive gives you the most stability. The batteries and the motors are all to the rear of the chair. So the chairs are equipped with rear anti-tippers so that if you do hit an incline or you're going up a steep curb, you can um, counteract the, the tendency of the chair to tip back onto those anti-tippers. One big difference, depending on where the drive wheel is located on any power chair, is it affects how the chair turns. So in a rear wheel drive chair, all of the turning is going on in front of you. As you make a turn to the right, your feet are going in front of you and all of the chair is turning in front of you. So I like to describe this as if you're going into a hallway and you need to make a turn into a room, you're going to approach that room on the far side. So you have the most room in front of you in order to make the turn and turn into the room. Next. The rear wheel drive was really designed to improve the turning radius, give people the greatest indoor maneuverability. And as I mentioned earlier, when you move the drive wheel right underneath the user, you have to add a second set of casters. So there's a uh, ease in learning how to drive because the wheel's operating right underneath you. Um, but the, the trick is, Part of the chair is turning in front of you, and part of the chair is turning behind you. So again, using my description of heading down a hallway and needing to make a turn into a room, in a mid-wheel drive chair, you head down the middle of the hallway because part of the chair is going to turn in the front, and you have to have some room in the back of the chair for the back of the chair to turn. 
Next. The last group for particularly outdoor mobility is a front wheel drive chair. And a front wheel drive has a couple of advantages, particularly, as I said, for outdoor driving, because your drive wheel is what's going to climb those obstacles. So, and from a seating position, if your knees are particularly tight and you're not able to stretch your legs out to have them fit on foot pedals right in front of you, the advantage of a front wheel drive is the foot pedals can be very close to the front edge of the chair. So there's a tightness to the front end of the device that is useful for some folks. It does drive more like a forklift because when you make that turn, it's the rear end of the chair that's going to swing out behind you. So as I'm approaching my hallway, I'm going to approach the door closest to the wall so that there's clearing space behind the chair. Really the best way to determine what's going to work best for you is to do some test driving. It's remarkable to me that some people just gravitate very easily to a front wheel drive and they have a much harder time with a mid wheel drive. So give yourself a chance to do some test driving before determining which style of drive wheel you want to um, investigate. Next. With the bigger power bases, there's an opportunity to add power seating. And power seating is a really critical feature if you're spending four, five, six, up to 10, 12 hours a day sitting in a wheelchair because it allows you to control and change your own position. And there are three different varieties, actually a bunch of varieties we're going to go through, but the um, most frequent, a power tilt, just like in the tilt manual chair, you could change your whole position without changing your seat to back angle or the angle between the seat and the footrest. So you're changing your position relative to gravity. That's helpful if, if you have spasms or if you have contractures that make it difficult for you to change the position of your body parts while you're sitting in the chair. If you have full range of motion at your hips and your knees and you like the ability to stretch out, then a power recline with elevating leg rest allows you to do that. You can stretch out while you're sitting in the chair. And then the third configuration is actually a combination of both. You can open up your seat, your back angles, and you can tilt. So it really depends on your tolerance of changing your angles while you're sitting or the ability to stretch and feel more comfortable in opening up your seat to back angle with recline and elevating leg rest. Two additional power seating options. Uh, just to note that this is a seat elevator and while it's functionally incredibly useful to improve your reach and as it's uh, pictured here, the woman in her kitchen you know, rather than looking at the side of the pot, she can actually look in the pot, know what's cooking, literally. Um, these are features that unfortunately our Medicare policy considers this a convenience item. But I can tell you for many people who are able to add this feature to their power chair, it adds a functionality and being able to reach things in your environment that are much harder to reach if you're at a fixed seated position. Next one. And then a, a feature that's available is the ability to stand while staying in a wheelchair. And it's available on, two st on both styles of chairs. So there are manual standards that are on manual chairs. One downside to this as a full-time device is the mechanism to give you this standing ability adds weight to your chair. So it makes it harder to get around. And then when you're in the standing position in the manual chair, you're not able to move. You are standing, but you're in a fixed position. 
Whereas the power stander on a power chair, when you're up in the standing position, you still have the ability to get around in your environment, although it'll always be at a slower speed because you're now in a much taller position and this chair is not as stable. Next. So we started at the base. We looked at what are the wheel options that are out there to allow you to get around and improve your mobility. But it really is only half of the story. And seating is so important, particularly if you're needing to use a chair for more than an hour or two to get from place to place. So I'm going to turn it over at this point now to my colleague, Faith, who's really going to talk about how seating can augment and improve your mobility and your posture and maintain your skin integrity and prevent pressure sores. Thank you, Jean. So what we want to look at is when you're sitting, how you look, and what are the benefits of that good posture. We want to start looking at the pressure under your bottoms, okay? So many people start to have problems with pressure injuries under their buttocks once they start sitting full time. And if we do this sitting right and provide the right support surface and the right surfaces, then we can help decrease the chance that you're going to get a pressure sore. We also want to increase your respiratory function. Again, if you're sitting slouched, it's much harder to breathe well. And if you're sitting better, your respiratory function can improve. We want to improve your swallowing and make sure you're not having any problems with aspiration. Um, we want to increase your ability to use your arms. Again, this could be just from using them to push a manual wheelchair or when you're in the power wheelchair, it can be to make sure you can access your keyboard or your computer or your iPad or even your phone. Um, and if you're sitting well, you're going to have more ability to move your arms in a good position. We want to improve your digestion. If we line up your body in the right way, we can help to make sure the food that you eat is going to where it needs to be instead of getting trapped. We want to help to, de to make sure you don't develop contractions. The better your position, the better chance that you won't get those contractions. And finally, we want to make sure that you don't have pain when you're sitting. Any of these problems, if you're having any of these problems, is a trigger, and I would say go and see a seating specialist and find out how to make improvements in this area. So first, we're going to look at next um, what we want you to look like. What should you be looking like, and how can we help you? So if you look at the person on the left, they're sitting nice and upright. You can't really see it because their hands are in the way, but their pelvis is nice and level. They're getting even pressure underneath their bottom. Their trunk is right in midline. They're not leaning more to the left or to the right. Their shoulders are level, and they're more relaxed, and they're, they can move their arms more freely. Their head is balanced right over their body. Uh, their thighs are slightly open, and their feet are right underneath their knees. If you look at the person on the right, you can see she is not in that ideal posture, okay? She's leaning to the right, her head is to the right, okay? She cannot, with the way the chair is set up right now, bring herself and pull herself over so that she's sitting like the person on the left. She needs adjustments to make this um, her posture better. Next. So this is one of the women that I knew that I knew from my nursing home and the first chair was what she came to us in and then we were able to go and do modifications to that chair so we used the same chair as she had but we changed the seating and once we changed it you can see now her head is in midline her trunk is in midline her pelvis is leveled and her feet are right, in, right underneath her and now, even though I didn't ask her to, if I asked her to lift up her arm, she would much more easily be able to lift up her arm. And she could drive her wheelchair with her right arm. And she was able to reach that joystick and drive with much more ease than in the first picture. Next. From the side view, again, we want that head to be right over this trunk. 
okay? We want the pelvis to be in a good, upright, neutral position. We want your spine to maintain their natural curves. Our shoulders are over our pelvis and our head is balanced. Our hips and knees are in good position. And again, it has to do with how much you can bend. Um, but as you can see, we're, we're bent in a pretty good position. Um, your heels are directly below the knees. Okay, so we have about 90 degrees at the ankles, 90 degrees at the knees, and a little bit opened up at the back, at the pelvis. All right, and we want to make sure our feet are flat on the floor. Uh, many times, if you're having trouble getting into this position, I'll find a nice big triangle uh, behind your butt. And that's when you can't get your hips all the way back in the chair, and it can be for many different reasons. But you want to be able to get your uh, buttocks right against the back support to be able to give your low back and pelvis good positioning and support so you don't end up with back pain. Um, on the right, you can see how the woman is first leaning over to the side. And I know you can't see that little triangle, but there is a triangle there that she is not having her buttocks rest against the back support. And her feet are also not flat on the foot plates. Her heels are up and are not being supported by the foot plates. Next. Here she is in a more upright position. Now, she did have some hip contractures, and that is why she's leaning back a little bit more. But there is no triangle behind her buttocks. Her buttocks are against the back support, and she, doesn't, she no longer has back pain. Uh, her feet are now supported. Again, she had a little bit of tightness in her ankles, and I accommodated for that angle and made sure she had good stable foot positioning, good knee positioning, and good buttock positioning. And she is much more comfortable in this position and much freer to move her arms. Next. And finally, from the top view, you want to make sure that your pelvis and trunk are not rotated. You want your head facing forward. You want your knees pointed forward and your feet pointing forward, just as in the picture. As soon as you start to be rotated, you start to put more pressure underneath your bottom and are putting yourself at more of a risk for getting a pressure injury. Okay, so now what we want to do is say, how do we get to look that well? How do we end up finding our sweet spot, sitting well, feeling good, being as straight as possible, and making sure we have good weight distribution on, on our, under our bottom so that, that we don't get a pressure injury. Next. So the first thing I do when someone comes into my clinic is we have a background discussion. I need to find out what the issues are, what types of problems you're having, and what you want to have in terms of your bag of tricks to make sure you can be as productive as possible. I want to look at your transfers, your skin, your skin condition, and your sensation. Many times people with MS have decreased sensation, and so they might end up sitting upright for longer periods of time because they can't tell that their bottom is getting sore and that they might have a problem. So we need to know this so we can build in issues regarding the sensation and make sure that you get not just good pressure distribution, but pressure relief. We want to look at your communication issues um, and make sure we plan for any type of communication device that you might need. We want to look at accessibility issues. Can you get into your home? Do you have steps? Should we be talking about any type of ramps at all? Um, are you planning on just using the chair in the home or you're planning on taking it outside? If you're taking it outside, how are you going to get around? Are you using a van? What types of transportation issues are we dealing with? How are you going to stabilize the chair once it's in a van or even in the back of a car? And then any other information that might be relevant to mobility and positioning. There is quite a long list. These are some of the critical areas, though, that we want to make sure we talk about before we move on. Um, next. After I complete that background discussion, I put everyone on the mat because I want to know exactly what kind of range of motion they have, 
what kind of tone they have, and what kind of postural issues they have. When someone comes in and they're sitting in a wheelchair, I look at their posture and start to note what type of problems they're having. When I lie them down on the mat, I can then see, is it because, are they sitting poorly because of their range or tone or just because of the way a wheelchair is set up? So I will look at your hip range, your knee range, your ankle range, your trunk range, your arm range, and your head and neck range, your whole body. I will look at your amount of tone you have and if any of your spasticity is affecting your movement. And I might even make recommendations to see your tone, a, a doctor, or a physiatrist, or neurologist to dus discuss your tone if I feel as if you're having any issues um, if your tone is affecting the way you sit. And I also will look and see if you have any type of pressure sores or redness underneath your bottom and behind your back. We are your most critical bony areas that we need to protect once we put you in a sitting position. Next, I'm going to do some type of sim seating simulation. I am very lucky that I have a seating simulator chair that I can take the numbers that I figured out when the person was on the mat, set them up in a seating simulator, and add arm support, trunk support, knee support, foot support, okay? And it assists me with finalizing the equipment needs. Next slide. Here, this person is just sitting from the side, and I can make sure the buttocks are all the way against the back support. I can make sure they're getting good weight distribution on their bottom and, and good positioning of their feet. I also, in this chair, can test different types of seat cushions. Most clinics do not have this style chair for testing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't still do testing of equipment. Power chairs and manual wheelchairs can be set up so that you can test your posture, figure out if you need tilt, figure out if you're going to need recline, and figure out what support surfaces am I most comfortable with, and what chair do I get the best pressure relief and pain relief so that I can sit comfortably throughout the day. And you can do either power or manual because in both style chairs, they have recline, you can get recline and tilt to be able to test these concepts and make sure you receive the equipment that's going to be most appropriate for you in the long run. Next. Once we know what you need for your seating and we know what you need for your mobility, we then combine these two systems for optimal posture, function, and comfort. So Jean discussed all the different types of frames that you could get, power chairs, manual wheelchairs, tilt, recline, elevating leg rests. You make those needs and then you take your ideal seating posture and you, and you put them together until you're satisfied with your final posture and your ability to move around. Next. I'm gonna, I have one case study that we wanna go over. Um, we're going to talk about Chris. She has been a resident at the Boston home and has been driving a power wheelchair independently since 2010 when she first moved to the Boston home. Her MS has slowly progressed. And in the last year, she has had difficulty driving in the late afternoon and performing her ADLs independently. So what she would do when she was first with us and up until, you know, a little bit ago, um, she was able to drive with a standard joystick. But what happened over time is the, her arm weakness got worse. And so in the afternoons and early evening, she would end up asking people to help drive her. She just didn't feel comfortable driving by herself. And so she had to help have someone help her to get to dinner and then get back to her room in the evening. So we evaluated her and noted that she had increased tone in her right arm, which was her driving arm. And on her left arm, it was no longer functional, so we could not depend on that arm for assistance. She had the decreased ability to drive, and we mainly noted it late afternoon and early evening. 
We felt that she still had enough hand control to use her hand for driving, but we didn't feel a standard joystick would work for her. So we assessed her for alternative drive controls. Next. We determined that she could use the joystick, but she needed a specialty joystick that was much more sensitive. We also determined she couldn't use it in the same position as she's always had it. We had to move it into an atypical position to accommodate for her tone and range issues. And we also determined that it wasn't cost effective to modify this chair that she was using, but we had another chair at the Boston home that we could use. And so we decided that we could um, move her seating to this other chair and then purchase just the drive control system that we needed for her use so that she could be an, a more independent driver. So she received the new drive system in May of 2016, and it took her about a month, but within a month she was able to safely drive the wheelchair, and she wasn't just driving it during the day, but also in the evening, and she did not need any further assistance going to dinner or getting back to a room after dinner. Um, it did take time to accommodate to the new change, and that because the, the joystick was more sensitive. She did have to modify how she performed some of her ADLs. Next. Here are some pictures showing her sitting in her chair in the position of the joystick. We're going to go quickly to the next slide because that's a close-up. Okay, so here's the atypical position of the joystick. It's set inside the armrest. And this whole mechanism is on a it's on a mechanism that just flips up out of the way. So to transfer in and out of the chair, it just flips up and it stays out of the way so that they can transfer her safely. And you can see her finger on the joystick. She grabs it and she has a couple different ways to use it, but she can safely adjust the chair and drive the chair. The blue switch that you can also see is for her tilt. So she takes her hand off the joystick and actually can press that button, tilts the chair independently, and she can use the buttons on the display, which I don't have shown, to go and change her mode so she can go faster or slower. Next slide. And here she is from the front, and she loves her iPad and does various um uses plays games as well as communicates with family members using her iPad and this has made a huge tremendous difference for for her she continues to be independent two years later driving her wheelchair tilting her chair changing her speeds and using her iPad next so the takeaways from this there is a vast array of both manual and power wheelchairs and seating systems available to meet your needs. You want to find therapists and suppliers with experience in wheelchair mobility and wheelchair seating. Too often I see people just call the supplier in, they go to the home and they don't get what they really need because the supplier does not always understand their range limitations, their tone limitations, and some of the other issues surrounding the big picture. So it's much better to have a team approach and have the therapist figuring out what your needs are, have the supplier helping with the equipment portion to make sure you get what you need, and being able to test the equipment to make sure it all is going to work, not just in the clinic setting, but in your home setting as well. Look for therapists and suppliers with ATP and SMS, as well as which are certifications through RESNA. You can actually go on the RESNA website, it's resna.org, to find out who those ATPs and SMSs are in your community. And all evaluations should include your background discussion, a MAT assessment, simulation either in what you're going to get or in a simulation chair as well as testing. And once everything's approved and the chair comes in and is ready, not just drop, dropping it off, but having it fit to you, having your footrest adjusted properly, your armrest adjusted properly, your head support adjusted properly, making sure everything fits and that you can drive safely, 
or propel safely, whichever you're using, manual or power, making sure the drive electronics, if you're in power, are set so that you can safely maneuver both inside your home and out in the community. And then receiving any specific training that you might need to make sure you're safe, as well as helping train the, your caregivers to make sure they know how to use a chair and assist you in any issues possible. Thank you all for listening, um, and we are uh, now ready to take some questions. All right, thank you so much for all that great information, and thank you everyone uh, who have submitted questions. Please keep sending those in. We'll get to uh, as many as we can uh, this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Gene and Faith, for walking us through a seating evaluation and for mentioning, um, you know, sort of test driving all these different devices that are out there. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about how someone would go about uh, finding a therapist or a supplier? Um, you know, what, what resources uh, are available to, to find someone like you? So in addition to what Faith mentioned in terms of the, the Resna website having a a search feature. Um, I can also recommend folks to uh, access their MS center. Very often the MS centers know who in their community have a expertise in what we call complex rehab devices. A little bit different than DME. DME might be routine devices, but you're needing to find somebody who can individually meet your needs. So the MS Center and looking for complex rehab providers. The other option is also to ask whoever your supplier is if they do complex rehab and if they have any specific clinics that they would recommend you go to um, for a thorough evaluation. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, kind of on that note, uh, by far the, the most common questions we received uh, were, were regarding uh, financial assistance and ways to to pay for these different devices that uh, that aren't cheap. Um, and, and we probably could do a whole webinar on Medicare and Medicaid and insurance, but uh, sort of sort of broadly, what resources or what tips would you provide to people uh, that may need help uh, affording some of these different devices and services? So it's important that you mention Medicare and Medicaid and uh, private insurances. And the all of those are medical insurance payers. So uh, wheeled mobility is a benefit under many insurances. The question is, what's the coverage? And just to give you an example, in Medicare, there is a requirement that the device has to be used in the home. So if persons living with MS, this can be a little problematic because you may be able to be ambulating in your home, but you need a mobility device outdoors. Then it doesn't qualify for Medicare coverage. So we often ask people living with MS, tell us about your worst days the hot day in August, the day that your fatigue level is really high, because that's the day I want to qualify you for a device for in the home. So there's a little bit of an art here. Uh, additionally, what I would say to anybody, it's always worth submitting the request. And if you get a denial, appeal, appeal, appeal. Very often, many insurance first responses is we're going to deny it and see if you want to fight for it. So initial denial, don't be discouraged. Ask for the assistance in appealing that decision. Another issue that another issue that comes up with your funding is if you do have private insurance and they won't, won't cover or you have to come up with your deductible of $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 before they'll start. Or they'll tell you we'll only give you $3,000 or $4,000 for the equipment, and now you're left with a big, huge $10,000, $15,000 bill to pay, especially if it's power. But even on a manual system, you can end up with a couple extra thousand dollars. 
So you can ask for some assistance from different groups. Um, you can also try to do some fundraising. Okay, there is so much more with, with fundraising online to get assistance to purchase equipment, as well as as various groups in your communities that will help if they know you need some equipment that's gonna make a difference in your life. Um, the other issue though, is if you have money, but just not a lot right away, some of the equipment companies are willing to do um, where you pay a monthly amount, essentially like an insurance, or not insurance, excuse me, a credit card type of system where you would pay X amount of dollars per month, depending on the final costs. So, you know, you can get some loans. There are loans and they're low cost loans. Um, so it's not like you're paying a lot of percentage, but by far the biggest thing is fighting the group that you have insurance with and trying to get them to pay for as much as possible. Gene, you mentioned uh, the you know the worst days of MS, and certainly MS is unpredictable with a lot of fluctuating symptoms. And some people can can walk fine one day, and, and then the next day, whether it's because of pain or or circulation, they just have a really hard time. So, uh, what would you say um, as you're strategizing for for a mobility device? How do you factor in the sort of fluctuating nature of of MS? Well. As part of the, the funding process, I as a clinician in faith in the same area, we need to create a letter of medical necessity. And so I will, in my background discussion, I will ask somebody to describe for me what is their mobility on their worst days, not their best days. I also find that this is a place where caregivers and loved ones will be you know, standing behind, looking at you going, no, she really can't walk that far on a bad day. So you may need to tap some other people to get a fuller information in terms of what's a bad day look like. And then I can justify the type of device that's needed on the bad day that then can be used any day that you want. So it's a place where pointing out the bad actually works to your advantage when trying to get funding. Excellent. Uh, Faith, you, you mentioned that good posture can really help with uh, digestion. And we received a, a specific question about, are there any uh, specific seating positions or something to keep in mind uh, to help with the digestive uh, discomfort connected with MS? My feeling is the straighter we can get you and hold that position. So not being slumped over. Okay, that's one of the biggest things. And on some of the chairs that Jean showed at the beginning with the sling back and sling seats, you tend to be more slumped and you tend to have more problems with, with your digestion, okay, and with the swallowing. So the straighter that I can get you and making sure that you have an appropriate back support as well as your hip angle is appropriate, is going to just put you in a better position to get the better digestion. Digestion's hard because that's such an internal thing and I'm trying to take your body and extend it and stretch it out as much as possible so that there's a much straighter line as the food is going down. Um, so it's really getting, knowing what to do with your body, knowing how upright I want to get you, but also doing that mat assessment so I know what's what's the problem? Why aren't you getting in this position? Why are we having so much trouble? Okay, is it that your seat depth is too long so you slid forward in your chair? Okay, or is it that your hips don't bend well and so you slide forward in your chair? And every time you slide forward, it changes the your, your trunk posture. It puts you in a position where it's not as easy to swallow. It's not as easy to have that food going the right way. So it's really getting you as upright as possible. And if you look back on the slides later, look at the side view of the person and how upright they are. That's what I want to try to achieve to improve that digestion. That's great advice. Thank you. 
Uh, Gene, we received a number of questions with concerns of just uh, transporting uh, the mobility scooters in a car. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice on uh, or what options are available to, to lift up scooters and, and to get them in and out of trunks easily? So, yes, there are a variety of uh, accessible transportation options. These tend to fall into either a vocational rehabilitation funded device if you have access to the device that allows you to stay in the workforce. Otherwise, they're often private pay. But the options range from literally a little arm that will come out and attach to the scooter and lift the scooter and bring it into the back of an SUV, for example. So you usually need a, a trunk. I mean, sorry, uh, you need more space than just a trunk. You need the, the back of a wagon or um, an SUV. An alternative, if you have some limited ambulation from the back of the car forward to either the driver's side or the passenger side, uh, there's a, a little device we call a tilt and tote. So you get a, a hitch on the back of your car, like a, um, uh, to attach a, a boat, a hitch or a trailer hitch. And on, on that hitch, a small graded uh, platform is mounted and it's designed so that it tilts so that one edge of the platform hits the ground you can roll either the wheelchair or the scooter up onto the platform and as the scooter comes on it acts like a teeter-totter if you will it levels out and it basically attaches on the outside of the car in line with the bumper we call those tilt and totes and then the the third option particularly for uh, full-time power mobility where getting out of the device and sitting in the car seat is also difficult, is really to move from a sedan type car or a um, SUV to a minivan. And many of the minivans now have drop floors so that you can have a much uh, lower ramp into and out of the van itself. Used vans, are available that have already been modified so that's another way to look at um, acquiring the transportation option and then lastly certainly in a geographic in a urban area look into what might be the accessible public transportation options there might be a paratransit option or um, the actual city buses or train systems may be accessible in your area. That's great advice, thank you. Um, there's also uh, quite a few concerns about if, if they go into a power chair or into a wheelchair that there might be a decrease in muscle strength um, and just a, a loss of, of strength by not walking. Um, is, that, is that a concern that, that you see a lot in your practice and, and what can someone do to sort of compensate for that? So the one thing that we notice is when mobility is exercise itself, if you're working really hard to stay on that rollating walker or to use those canes and trying desperately to stay ambulatory, you're actually stressing your body more than it probably can tolerate. When you move into a mobility device whether it's a well-fitting ultralight chair or a scooter or a power chair, you're restoring functional mobility. You're able to go where you wanna go without that exercise factor. And then you have a chance to add exercise to your day. You can choose to use a weights for your upper extremities, use a, uh, we call it the uh, TheraBand, um, some resistive exercises, particularly if somebody's a manual wheelchair rider, we encourage people to exercise the opposite muscles. So you're used to 
pushing with your arms and using the bicep muscles, the muscles on the front of your arms, we encourage you to exercise the muscles on the back side of your arms. So what we often do is when we recommend a power mobility or any new mobility device, we encourage people to also engage in exercise activities. Get out of the chair, take a walk. If you have the ability to go into a swimming pool, awesome way to give yourself exercise without mobility being that only form of exercise. I call this the genius of and. Good mobility and the ability to exercise. Fine. And some other exercising options would be to use a bike. There are sit-down bikes you can use for both your arms and your legs. You can go to your local Y and use some of the equipment that they have. And sometimes you have a Y that's very active. And actually, one of the Ys here in the Boston area actually has a program set up for people that have disabilities and they have equipment set up specifically for them to use either from their wheelchair or to be or to easily transfer into the equipment and to safely be able to do any type of weight training we have a great program called sit and fit so you can like still that. be fit while you're sitting in a wheelchair so we have a, a number of support partners um that that are watching or, or listening this evening. Um, any advice to them on, on how they could be involved in this process and specifically if, uh, if the person with MS is just having a hard time um, accepting the need for mobility device or you know it's, it's definitely a sensitive subject. Um, any, any advice to the support partners out there? Uh, it is an emotional emotional subject and and I think the the first thing we like to do is acknowledge that emotion and then really ask somebody, is there an activity that they get a lot of pleasure from and joy that they have slowly weaned themselves away because they didn't have the energy or the balance or the uh, endurance to continue to engage in. And sometimes, you know, thinking a little outside the box and you know we could rent a chair for 30 days that might feel like I'm not buying the chair but the person has the experience of oh I could go to the soccer game or oh I was able to stay at the museum longer because I was more comfortable being wheeled around than trying to to walk around so if there's a particular activity that someone is gets pleasure out of, it's really nice to link the, the chair as a tool that allows that person to be engaged in that activity. Um, and then recognizing and acknowledging the chair does represent a change in function, but it can also be a tool to restore your ability to get around. Faith, any any tips that or, or any tool or ideas that you have to help people sort of adapt uh, this change in, in their lives? It, it, it's all it's always hard. It's always hard because no one wants to accept that they're changing and they're getting worse, and that's that's always the hardest part. But again, look at you know your your loved one and say we need to do what's best for you, and maybe I'm struggling with it, but let's make what's best for you because why are we making our lives harder? You know, why are we making everything harder for ourselves? We can make it easier. It might be as easy as adding a ramp. Um, it, you know, there's just lots of different things that I watch people do and they say, no, we like it the way it is. And they're like, are you doing what you want to do during, the, during your time together? And so it's, it's a struggle but it's really opening up and accepting the change. And I don't want to say change is ine inevitable because some people stay stable for years and years. Long time, yep. <laughs> and, and other people, you know, change rapidly. But it's being able to be with them and accept this is what's happening. It's not like I'm doing it on purpose. It's a medical issue that's happening. And we need to accept that 
and help them move and become more independent and be able to do more in their environment. Well, I think that's a great way to, to wrap things up this evening and hopefully uh, everyone out there can, can see how some of these devices can be a, a tool and a sign of strength uh, to improve quality of life. Um, and, and you got a better idea of the different options that are out there and the different resources to help you find the device that's right for you. Uh, so Gene and Faith, thank you so much for, for that great information and for your time and sharing your years of experience and expertise. And thank you to everyone out there for joining us this evening. Uh, I do wanna let you know about a few more resources uh, because we really believe that education is, is power and, and it can help you take control over over your life with MS and certainly the National MS Society, we, we've referenced a couple times tonight, they have some wonderful uh, brochures um, and some different articles. Um, and all three of these are included in your handouts that are on your toolbar, but you'll also get a PDF copy of uh, all these slides. You can click directly onto these links uh, to access these great resources. Uh, the National MS Society is also great for local resources. So if you want to find a seating specialist uh, or a supplier in your area, if you call 1-800-FIGHT-MS, um, they'll have someone uh, during standard business hours, Monday through Friday, that can connect you uh, locally. Um, and nationalmssociety.org is, is a great resource with lots of brochures and more information for you. And of course, Can Do MS, uh, we have uh, uh, lots of resources on our website, which is cando-ms.org. Uh, we also do in-person programs uh, all over the country. Uh, so please visit our website to see if we're coming to a town near you. And please continue to join us every month for our webinar series. Uh, you will need to re-register re uh, for the 2019 webinar series, uh, but you only have to do it once. So if you uh, click on this link or visit our website, Register once and you'll be all set for uh, for 12 more webinars here in 2019. I also like to let you know about our Ask the Can Do team. If we didn't get to your question tonight, uh, you can submit a question online and we'll, we'll pass it on to one of our programs consultants and try to get you an answer uh, to your question or at least point you in the right direction. And finally, uh, we have a new resource called MS Path to Care. And this is all about shared decision making. And we certainly talked about different team approaches tonight and getting your uh, neurologist involved and your primary care physician and your physical therapist and your seating specialist all involved in helping you make decisions uh, that, that are best for you and, and your MS and your overall wellness and quality of life. So to, to learn about some of those skills and resources, please visit mspathtocare.com. And finally, I'd like to let you know about KickMS, which is our new peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform. Uh, it's super easy to get started. Um, instead of Christmas presents or a birthday party, you can ask for donations, uh, take part in a run or walk event, host a barbecue, host a bake sale. The ideas are endless, but uh, you, this is what allows us to put on free programs online and all over the country. So it's a really easy way to uh, to get involved with Can Do MS and to make sure that we can uh, continue to put on these types of programs. And if you're in a position to uh, provide a donation, um, there's certainly different ways to do that. And you can click right on these links um, to ensure that we can continue to put on free programs. Uh, the last thing I would like to encourage you to do is to please fill out our survey. Uh, as soon as we finish here in about 30 seconds, <laughs> um, a survey will pop up on your screen. Uh, this is what allows us to really see what's being helpful, what information was of value to you, what information did you wish we talked about this evening. Um, this allows us our, for our programs to, to be better and better. So please uh, take a moment to fill out the surveys and join us uh, next month, um, which will be a, a brand new year on January 8th, 2019, will be our first webinar of 2019 on living well with MS, health awareness and promotion. And this is all about setting goals uh, for the new year uh, in our different areas of wellness. Um, and so it'll be a lot on goal setting and some different areas of health and wellness, uh, a great way to, to make some resolutions for 2019. So with that, I wish uh, everyone a really good evening. Please uh, complete the surveys. Please re-register for our webinar series in 2019. And I hope everyone feels well. And uh, again, Jean and Faith, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I hope uh, you, you enjoyed sharing your knowledge with everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. All right. Have a good night, everyone, and happy holidays.